Uh, today we want to talk to you about uh, a piece of malware called Formook, which, uh, well, we, 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 we will try to showcase a good example that what we believe is uh, cybercrime and the cybercrime industry and how it works and what it does and how it does what it does. Okay? So first we will introduce ourselves. Then, because I don't know exactly what background each of you has, we want to introduce just a tiny bit how cybercrime is uh, right now at this point in time. At this point in time, then we will overview um, the malware sample, the distribution of the malware sample, the panel, how it works, the tricks it has, that kind of stuff. And afterwards, we will just talk about uh, the threat actor behind this uh, behind this malware, the developer who made the malware, and his history with with it. Okay. So let's start. I'm Victor Athin. I am Labs team lead at Blueleaf. My, my job mainly entails a threat analyst with a bit of reverse engineering on the side. I know. I wish as well that this was uh, like the other, the other way around, but it is what it is. Uh, if you have any doubts about uh, and or you have any questions that we can answer right now, you can just send an email. Okay. Hi, I'm Borja. I'm working in Blueleaf uh, for four years. Uh, the last two, uh, I'm Labs team member, and I work in, I'm working doing threat analysis and uh, threat actor tracking and other things. <laughs> okay, so let's cut to the chase. The interesting part. That's that's better, right? Hello. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Cybercrime is a living entity, it adapts to countermeasures, and it evolves with time. What does this mean? That means that uh, when we try to look at, uh, at, at, in, at an event that happened related to cybercrime, we also need a context, and that context is usually like time and uh, the technology available, world events, that kind of stuff, okay? Which is what we will try to do right now. What, wow, okay, so what you cannot see here is <laughs> is a picture representing the current state of cybercrime. Right now, cybercrime can be seen as a sort of industry in which you have like you have your providers, you have people creating services, you have channels to exchange information, you have channels to sell information, and you have clients from uh, organizations, well-organized groups. You have uh, script kiddies, you have almost everything in here. People that uh, code for money, people that just, uh, his only job is focused purely on distribution of malware, others that the only thing they do is just trying to gather information as well and sell it related to distribution campaigns. And then you have researchers meddling in the middle, which sometimes you find as well. In this case, because we're dealing with a mal malware-related um, <coughs> cybercrime operation, uh, I wanted to, to, to introduce you to the concept of the kill chain. The kill chain is just like this, uh, this, uh, these steps which describe what the threat actor or what the threat actors have to do from the moment they decide they want to infect someone or some uh, group of people to the moment in which they manage to steal their data. The first step, which would be reconnaissance, is just an attempt to gather information. Let's say you want, for example, to attack a company, a known company. So what you want to do is you want to find out how do they configure their users, how their emails work, what kind of signatures they have, do they have a firewall, do they have a WAF, that kind of stuff, you know, some, anything that can stop you when you try to attack them. In this case, for example, uh, if you wanted to attack a United uh, Kingdom uh, people, just in general, you know, like targeting civilians, you would need to acquire a list of emails that you know belong there, because that way you can make very focused campaigns. The next step, which is weaponization, would be to look for that exploit, that exploit kit, uh, that uh, vulnerability, or just a word macro that you can use in order to infect those people. Lure, which is the next step. These four steps can be almost, uh, these three steps can al almost always go together. So in an email, for example, in an email campaign, you would have an email with an attachment, and that email has a content, and that, that email is sent to someone in particular. So. The email might be the lure, like, hey, have you, sex? have you seen these photos in here that I'm sending you? The, the weaponization might be the exploit that's inside those photos. And the redirectional exploitation would be when you manage to get the user to open that, that file. Once the user, the user has opened that file, the infection phase begins. This is when the malware sets up his, his house, and he gains persistence, and he decides that he's going to live in that computer 
because it's of interest to him. So we are assuming that it's, a, it's able to tell one real uh, user from a VM, from a sandbox, from a researcher sandbox, you know, that kind of stuff. After verifying all of that information, it will contact its command and control server, which is the server that the threat actor or threat actors, the group, will use in order to like manipulate the sample. And then it will begin stealing data. So, for formwork. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot about this. Uh, <laughs> in here, I, I'm just showing some examples of uh, forums, mostly frequent by script kiddies and that kind of stuff, that kind of uh, low-level profile in which they are already like offering in, in here in this last entry says Windows installation uniqueness. This is a guy offering a service. He has already a botnet deployed with, I'm just making this up because I don't, I can't remember the exact number, but uh, 1000 bots. And he says, look, I have already 1000 computers. I am renting them to you. You can infect those computers if you want. And you skip the four, the first four steps of the kill chain. And he's just offering that service. In here you can see, People offering tutorials, how to create an exploit pack, newbie for newbies, that kind of stuff. Uh, here, tutorial for newbies, how to set up an HTTP botnet panel. So they are trying to transfer knowledge. They are trying to teach future uh, cyber, crime, um, cyber crime people who, are, who will want to commit uh, felonies as well. And that's just another example as well. Okay, now about Formbook. What is Formbook? Formbook is known for being one of the best uh, information stealer uh, malwares out there. It has support for more than 80 applications. Porja will tell you about that afterwards. It's the techniques it uses uh, are known as form grabbing and key logging. I am sure most of you know what key logging is, but form grabbing, uh, it's not such, it doesn't, it's not so, so known as key logging. Form grabbing is basically a technique which uh, works through in infecting a known process, for example, the Chrome process, and then hooking the calls it makes to make the requests to, your, to the server he's contacting. That way he can examine the buffer that you can have in that request and steal information from there. It also, it's also a credential stealer. We call credential stealers every malware that has the capability of going to the Chrome, Firefox, or uh, Internet Explorer vault uh, the vault is where they store the credentials. You know that message that pops up, hey, do you want to store your credentials for this very critical service? Yes. Okay, well, when you get infected, the malware will go to that uh, database and steal all your stuff. And then another characteristic that I find is very interesting, besides being sold on underground forums instead of markets or from peer-to-peer, -peer, which also happens, is that uh, Formbook offers a subscription plan. You can basically pay, like, $30 a month, and you get your domain, and you get uh, your host, and you get your sample, and you only have to distribute it. And everything else is set up for you. So, in order to understand how Formwork works and how the people around it uh, are using it, we need to analyze every piece of knowledge that we get. And from a research point of view, the pieces of knowledge we get are command and control servers, we get samples, we get emails used by the, for the distribution, we get um, almost everything we can, communications, keys they use. All of that is what we call indicators of compromise or indicator of actor. And this stuff can identify a single actor among a group, for example, or a, a, a targeted attack just based on that information. And it's what we will try to showcase today. Okay. Now work will continue with the distribution and the campaigns we have detected for this presentation. Uh, while we were investigating for MOOC, uh, we found uh, some campaigns that were a distribution of Formbook uh, through email campaigns. Uh, these emails have attached an RTF document, and the most affected countries uh, were uh, United Kingdom, uh, United States, Canada, South Korea, and France. Uh, this campaign was executed uh, in the last quarter of uh, 2019, and uh, these documents uh, take profit about uh, two, two exploits, uh, named Microsoft Office Memory Corruption Vulnerability and uh, Microsoft Windows Common Controls ActiveX Control Remote Code Execution Vulnerability. I know that the name is like very yeah. long, but I'm sure you have... Uh, do you remember, uh, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, do you remember like uh, a news piece that said, hey, be careful because uh, we found the vulnerability that exploits the equation... 
the equation, the uh, yeah, formulary for for docs. Well, that's that's the thing that they're using. Yeah. Uh, both of them are affecting the Microsoft Office software, and the two are uh, uh, buffer overflow vulnerabilities too. Uh, while we're investigating this, uh, we found that uh, they are using uh, common subjects. Uh, all of them uh, are talking about the products order. That we found that there are eight uh, different subjects, the quotation and inquiry that we found six different and documents. We here can see some of the subjects they were using. And we found four different uh, campaigns using different uh, emails. We can see here that they bought some some uh, uh, domain. And here they were using a free domain and using Gmail, maybe from accounts that were uh, stealing. Uh, here we can see two of the two examples of the emails used. Uh, we can see that the both are use, uh, targeting some corporations and they want to to infect this kind of people. Yeah, basically the content of the email plus the subjects we've seen before they make reference to corporate contexts, which yeah. is why we assume that they are targeting companies and not particular people yeah. or individuals. Then uh, okay. now. Victor will talk yeah. about the model. about the thingy, the reverse engineering thingy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, first thing, and that's something that I find very interesting. Formbook is sold and packed. That's not usually happens. Usually, when you buy uh, when you buy malware and you find malware, the malware usually comes uh, with a builder, and the builder is uh, has some sort of FUD, uh, which is a uh, fully undetectable uh, packer. Which uh, gives uh, gives you a final payload that uh, allows you to just distribute it immediately. That way, when you sell your stuff to script kiddies, they won't fuck up, okay? And send something that's just the, the raw malware. This works in our favor and against us. In this case, I found uh, I found Formbook with uh, Visual Basic script packers .NET, C++, Delphi packers. Very different stuff, you know, with very different techniques and packing into a new, into a new process and packing in the same layer. And as I was saying, this has advantages and disadvantages. Mind you, these are switched around. These are advantages for them, not for me. Okay. So one of the advantages is that it's hard to unpack automatically. I like, when I'm, when I'm investigating a new sample or when I'm trying to follow a campaign, one thing that I try to do is to make a script that will automate the unpacking so that I can more easily identify changes and that kind of stuff. Well, this is hard with uh, Formbook, basically because each packer uses its own technique and recognizing them, it's more difficult. On the other hand, as a disadvantage for them, you can find samples that are not packed making the first step of, of of trying to understand the malware and find samples for that malware a bit easier. Another thing that I found that was very interesting as well is that Formbook has a ton of anti-features. Anti-features are all of those features that what they work for is to hinder the researcher, uh, the researcher analysis of the sample. And these are just like uh, anti-debuggers, anti-sandbox VM, anti-analysis, all of that stuff. I wanted to make a special mention, and I will ask anyone who speaks French in the room to please forgive me for making your ears bleed. I wanted to thank Gemi Julian, um, no, I know that I didn't pronounce that very well, from Stormshield, who, pro who published like a very, 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 very detailed blog post related to these anti-measures. Okay, so let's just have a quick overview of these measures. Uh, for anti-sandbox and anti-VM techniques, it has like the dynamic function calling. It has uh, it loads it loads its own copy of NTDLL, so that it erases any hooks you may have in that. Uh, it checks for running processes that are known to be used by researchers. It uh, checks the loaded DLLs, uh, sandbox paths, usernames, um, and there are a few more that haven't been listed. I wanted to speak about uh, just. To add a bit of my thingy here, <laughs> just a couple of screenshots about uh, dyna the, the dynamic function calling. Uh, as we will see later on, Formbook tries to have like the least amount of, of information available uh, on the go for, for the researcher. So everything is encrypted in buffers. And in this case, it has a buffer with the list of hashes. And these hashes correspond to the CRC32 of a function name. 
Okay, so when it wants to make a dynamic, when it wants to call a function, in this case, uh, NT system query information, what it will do, it will resolve the address first. And afterwards, in here, I'm not sure if you can see it, there's a call EAX, which will make the, the dynamic call. Okay, so how does it do that? First, it gets the CRC32 for that call, and then it goes to the header of NTDLL, in this case, looks to the expert functions, makes the CRC32 of all of the functions until it finds a match. As you can see here, in EAX, you have the same value here, then you have, whoa, that moved, but, uh, that's like a Python uh, command line, and you can, in, in, in here, down here, you can see that there is the same number of, than up there, and that's the CRC32 for NT query system information. After doing that, it will just perform the call. As you can see in AX, you have the beginning of the function. Okay? It also, I also wanted to mention, I don't know if there's a, a lot of uh, malware savvy uh, researchers here, but uh, when malware wants to iterate around uh, the different processes that are running in the system, what you usually see is, uh, is them making use of a function called create a help snapshot 32 tool, something like that, which just takes a snapshot of the processes that are running, okay? In this case, what it does is use the function that I mentioned previously, NC query system information, with the flag you can see down there, uh, system process information, which will return the same structure or one very similar to that of the other call. But this is like way sneakier. When you are checking out the behavior of the sample, instead of seeing a, a call that just tells you, hey, I'm looking at all the, at all the processes, you just see something querying for information. And unless you know that 05 is the flag that you need to get that information, you're lost. I just thought it was cool. As for uh, other things it does, it checks for, uh, for anti-debugging as well. And in this case, it checks for kernel debugging, which is not, it's something unusual as well using the same function I mentioned before, and then instead of going to, like every malware, to the P, to the PEB and checking if it's being debugged with, uh, am I being debugged, it just checks if there's a uh, process debug port open, which is a bit sneakier as well, and harder to bypass. Okay, now to the data encryption. Remember that I mentioned some buffers? Well, I hope that the AS ASM would be better, but uh, it is not, so, well, it's fine. I mean, the only thing it needs to do in order to decode the, the information, it has like two different functions to decode different types of buffers. Ones are encrypted, the others are encoded. The bytes that are, the buffers that are encoded are just, uh, it, he just applies like a series of transforms that I don't think they are a standard, they're just something he cooked himself. And the other one is encrypted with RC4, like almost everything else in the sample. In this case, what it does, and that's the interesting part, is you see that function here, get encrypted buffer? The only thing it does is call the next instruction, yeah? Call uh, sign, dollar sign plus five will call the pop AAX. When you do the pop AAX, after the call has pushed at the top of the stack the return address, you put the return address, which is the beginning of the function, at the at, in AAX. Okay. So now you have this address in AAX. When it returns, it will move. It will add two to AAX. So now it's pointing here, and it will get into the code block. The code block. The only thing that will do is check if that begins with the prelude of the function, as you can see in here. Yes, 55, 8B, like here, 55 and 8B. If it begins with the prelude of the function, it knows that that after that call, there is an encrypted buffer. It will add three, yeah? And that gets you this address here, which is the beginning of the encryption buffer. I just thought that was something cool, he does. It's not, nothing in here is new. I mean, uh, all of, all of this is done by other samples. I just think that framework is very interesting because it, it kind of gathers a lot of uh, small things and, and small techniques. Uh, what you can see in here, any reverse engineer will tell you that this looks like a, like a check-in function. Every time that, uh, that, uh, formbook detects, uh, Every time that launches one of those antis, so the anti-debug, the, the kernel debugging, the MI being executed in a sandbox, every time it does that, it will fill in a structure that it keeps internally. And this structure has got just a bunch of flags, and that's what it's looking at here. Okay? Every one of these conditions is, am I being debugged? No. Am I in a sandbox? No. Am I, am I in a VM? No. Next, 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 next. When you have reverse engineered some samples, the first thing you will try to do is say, okay, I'm just skipping. All of this, I don't care what you think, uh, you, what, what you think, um, what you I don't care where you think you are. I'm telling you where you are and you are not in a sandbox, so continue your execution. Thing is, every time it fails one of these checks, it modifies the CRC32 list. 
So the next time it attempts to resolve a function, it will get a null pointer, it will call to a null pointer, and the sample will crash. So you have to actually manage to bypass each of them one by one, or else you don't get the sample to execute. Assuming it passes all of those checks, it injects a payload into Explorer, sneakily as well, using lesser known uh, methods, and then it selects an executable from a list of processes, and then if that everything that if everything worked correctly, it will tidy up the house, it will gain persistence, so it can survive reboots, and then it will delete the original sample. So there's no trace that it says it has been there. And then we'll start stealing data, which is the whole purpose of the malware. How does it do that? Besides uh, checking out the, the vaults, which is something that's very common already, uh, Formwick will hook different APIs, some of them which are very common, like uh, HTTP send request A or W, and then we'll just uh, put a hook in there and get the buffer when you're trying to send a request. When examining the buffer, if in the buffer it has some keywords like login, username, password, it will keep that data and send it to the command and control server. And now he has your data. The interesting part about this, it, God damn it. Okay, the inter <laughs> sorry. I, I just was using like a white screen and everything looked fine, but uh, in here it just compressed a bit, sorry. Uh, it, what it does in here, uh, I don't know if you can, well, I think the highlighted parts are clear enough. So basically this is just a dump uh, with volatility of a process being uh, hooked by my form book. And what it has done, it has hooked a module that it's from, uh, from, it's very targeted because it's from the Mozilla, the Mozilla framework. It's nss3.dll and this has a function called peer write, which is used to write to buffers or sockets. So that's where has, he has put this very, like very surgical, very surgical hook. Instead of hooking a more common API, it's targeting Firefox specifically, and I just thought that was relevant as well. And now Borja will continue with an explanation related to the panel and the communications. Uh, in the last month, uh, Formbook was evolved a lot, and uh, uh, you now can find the version 4.2. But the most common versions, what we can find in the wild, uh, were the, the 3.8 and the 3.9. But uh, here we can see the version 3.1 that it's it was. Uh, published in a forum. Uh, when you're logged in, uh, you can find the dashboard. In this, you can see uh, some statistics about the exfiltrated data here. And, well, <laughs> here you can see some of the users uh, and where was uh, their last login. And uh, you can see the panel has a lot of the languages with support to translate this this panel. Uh, you have a lot of detailed views about the the forms, the case strokes, or the 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 passwords that uh, Formbook was stealing, and uh, you can see there uh, a feature of Formbook that is pretty cool because it's uh, like a file browsing in the in the computers that were infected by Formbook. In this case, this function. In this case, this functionality in this version uh, wasn't finished, but in, in the newest uh, versions, it's it's working. And there you have a view uh, with the, the control panel of the users. Uh, every customer have a, a panel, individual panel, that it's identified with this part of the path. This is the account name of the of the panel. Every customer have one, but Every panel can have uh, multiple users. Uh, let's talk about the encryption and the communication with the C2. Uh, the first uh, step to, to do the communication is to get a key. Every key is unique per each uh, account, account name. Uh, to do this, uh, Formbook takes the domain and the, and the account name and do a hash that has his result. This uh, is not the final key because uh, Formbook do a, a special. It's not a special operation. He changed the endianness of the of the hash to get the little endian version of the hash, and then we have the key, and we can uh, encrypt the communication using RC4. Then the first step of the of the sample to is is register itself in the panel. To do this. Uh, 
must send uh, a special packet that starts with a magic header identified by FDNG, followed by a CRC32, uh, the version of the panel, the operating system name, and the user encoded in base64. All this information is uh, encrypted in RC, in RC4 and is included in a random parameter that later will be used. Uh, you can see here in green uh, some information and a parameter that are fake parameters to try to uh, disguise the, the, the other parameters and the important things. To exfiltrate the information, the first of all, uh, take the information and identifies every packet uh, with this string, where they say the software that are affected and the kind of, or the type of the information that he's exfiltrating. Uh, with all this information, uh, the sample encrypts it and uh, uh, put it inside the, that parameter, uh, followed by another time the user in base64, and this parameter that it's important because it's it's an integer that identifies the type of the information that it's exfiltrating. All this information is another time encrypted in RC4 and put it inside the previous parameter that we seen. Then in, oh shit. Uh, this is the code of the, the, the panel. Okay. You can see here, uh, <laughs> A function that is called and this identifies the type of the, the data exfiltrated. Here, you can see that the beer parameter, when it's nine, he is calling a function that is called lock, uh, lock keys that is used to exfiltrate the case strokes, the recovery data, the passwords, and all this kind of information. Every packet that it's uh, sent to the C2 uh, recollects to uh, information like the IP, ID of the bot, and other kind of information that it's important for the bot. Uh, now we will talk about the, the threat actor and how the, the cells were evolving in, in the last years. Uh, the main actor, or um, the, the programmer of the form book is ngcoder that starts uh, his activity in hack forums, that it's an underground forum, uh, and starts taking part on, in programming uh, threads that are talking about assembly, C and C++, and some pen testing and, and hacking threads. Uh, initially, uh, he was selling some shell codes, but in February of 2016, he started to sell Formbook, the first version. The first version only was a farm grabbing uh, malware and uh, only works in Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome. Later, uh, in May of 2016, the version 2 was released. In this case, he added the, the one of the most important features, that is the recovery of passwords on, of some software like Outlook, Chrome, and Firefox. Uh, well, <laughs> he created a new a new thread to sell the version two. But when she started, he started to sell the version three. He updated this thread. Then we don't know how was the the yeah we the, don't know the, how, the advertise. how the how the logo looked. So yeah, we then, made an educated guess. Yeah, <laughs> we think that is pretty similar. Then. Uh, one of the things that is pretty cool in the in Formbook is that uh, in in July of the 2016, he started to sell Formbook as a service. He has three kind of plans uh, that you pay every week, every month, or every three months, and he hosts your panel and delivers you uh, the, the the binary. You can buy the binary uh, hosting your own your own panel too. Uh, well, this is the same. Uh, when you have the pro plan, when there are updates, you can 
uh, sent by private message your account ID, then he delivered you the binary updated with the new version. Uh, in April of 2017, the version 3 was released, and there are a lot of updates that were important, like the, the encryption of the communication, the FD Connect, and uh, more browsers and bug fixes that were updated. One of the important things here is this. Now, one computer can be infected by two or more form books. Then two people that uh, buy a different, a different uh, form book with his own account can infect the, the same computer. Well, uh, the prices were updated and then now were higher than the previous version. But you continue having the same kind of packages. Uh, well, uh, in October of uh, 2017, ngcoder stopped selling for book because they were used to email campaigns and they say that is not the, the way that he wants that for book were used. Yeah, suppose the for book is an educational tool and you have yeah. to use it, uh, you know, to spy your kids and your wife and this. <laughs> Okay, uh, after the sales stop, some, uh, some users uh, were scammed by imposters of NG Coder. They were uh, contacted via Skype. And, well, this is moved. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, at some point, we, I think we misplaced uh, this, uh, this screen. This is, this is just like yeah. the software supported back framework. Yeah, there uh, in the top of the images, you can see the softwares that have support to the uh, password recovery. And there are a lot of software that supports the case stroke uh, exfiltration, the, the form grabbing, and the sniffs. Yeah, the, to the people at the end, the, what was at top was just the browsers See, and browsers the other, and, and email, email clients. clients yeah. oh, okay. And this is repeated. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, after this, uh, Formbook seems that to be appeared in some markets uh, where it's selected to, like uh, this one that it's hack tools. It's a software or malware malware market, and there are other people that says that have uh, the cracked version of Formbook and sell it in other forums. Yeah, I get the feeling that the, the tendency of bad guys of using like dark themes is playing against us here. But uh, in this screenshot, you're supposed to see the text saying that, hey, yeah, I have form I have you can buy it from me as well. Yeah. I'm so cool. Uh, <laughs> and this is a guy, well, this is a guy that has three, um, three accounts of uh, subscription of Formbook, and he wants to sell uh, two of them. And they, uh, he says that he has the approval of the ng coder that is the main threat actor involved in this. Okay. Okay. Right. So now back to me. Wow. Really a relief to have these stops and be able to exchange, uh, you know, to, to have Borja take over because I sometimes forget to breathe. And at the end, was I like, well, oh my God, I have to stop speaking. And it was really hard. But, you know, well, uh, just as a conclusion, okay? Overall, Formbook appears to be coded by someone who has a bit of experience. It's not a malware made by some script kitty. And that's important because uh, by how he works, by having a subscription model, it allows lesser, you know, like less, lesser cyber criminals, to say so, to use his more advanced malware, which uh, gives them tools that they are not supposed to have and enables them to do more damage with the same technical knowledge. As you have seen during the, I hope, during the assembly detail uh, and, well, as you have not seen, thanks to yeah. Borja's uh, screenshot, the code is relatively clean. The, the flow of execution, it's kind of all right as well. Uh, it has extensive support for many applications. That means that the guy has actually went and just studied how they worked and what functions did they use and how to hook them in Windows 7 and Windows XP in Windows 10. So, you know, changes in versions, that kind of stuff. Uh, it also has been using, like, even though the, the techniques he uses, are, 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 they are known. They are not something new. He hasn't invented something new. But uh, the thing is that most of them are very sneaky, and you don't usually see them in common malware. So 
on the other hand, it does make use of very weak encryption mechanisms. Uh, I remember having, uh, when I was working in pen testing, I remember having a client telling me that RC4 is not encryption, it's encoding. So, you know, well, using RC4 for the communication and encrypting the buffers, it's not like very heavily encrypted. But I do believe this is the result, the result of a trade-off. If you want to be sneaky, you cannot use like uh, heavyweight type APIs like uh, the encryption APIs. So that might be the reason. On the other hand, the choice for the communication key, that is like a mistake for me, using the hash of, of the domain. And not being packed by default, that I do think as well it's a mistake or something that he could improve. So uh, even though it has its flaws, we do believe, well, we, we do know that the malware is being maintained still, yeah. but even though sales have stopped, if the malware is still, is still being maintained, that must mean that the guy has, is generating enough revenue with the client it has right now. Okay? So that makes him like a bit more dangerous because he cannot like focus on those clients and develop for them and we don't get the updates. Because when he was posting on the forum, hey, I have now implemented like a, a new system, a new hooking engine. Okay, so you just go to the part of the hooking and you see the changes. That makes it more difficult for us to follow him and to track him. And he keeps to, he gets to keep doing his job, which is like try to, to, to steal from people. I hope you have like seen the, what we intended with was to showcase just one research. We have uh, gone over distribution, how the malware works. We have seen the panel, the communication, encryption techniques it uses. With all of this information, uh, for example, the encryption key, we can track the different campaigns. We can track the different actors. We can try to correlate them. Uh, for example, as you've seen before, the emails, uh, using the email and uh, then the sample, the attached document, you can execute it in a sandbox, get the RTF, extract the payload. Uh, from the payload, extract the, the key or the, C or, the, or the command and control server, and you can follow a specific group, see who is targeting, why are they targeting them, what's the level of experience. And that's what we basically try to show you how we do it. Um, I believe you will find most of the IOCs we used for this in Relief Community. You can have even more IOCs for Formbook if you want to do a bit of, of poking around. We have uh, command and control servers, hashes. I believe there are even some emails. Yeah. Uh, I just I encourage you to come and get them if you want them. And also if you want to share, you're more than welcome. So, questions? I'm not seeing questions, but uh, I wanted to thank all of you because I think I've heard someone laugh at one of her jokes, and that really motivates me to keep improving and making my presentations better. So, see, that guy. Thanks. Okay. Hi, great job, guys. Uh, thanks mm -hmm. for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to know if, uh, do you have any estimation of how much money this, this guy may have, uh, <laughs> like gotten from the software, from the licenses? We did try to make an estimation, but it was running a bit wild, uh, about, yeah. for more guesses, which I think are very bad, the, he was about making about a half a million as of now. But that's like, I think yeah. we're generating because we were just trying to count the different uh, domains we found, which each, if, each, if each domain identifies a client, you can get the amount of the domain or the amount of time that path was active. And from that, you can try to, assuming he, they are using, because they're not dumb, the cheapest subscription, you can try to like guess. But I mean, well, probably some didn't pay, probably some are from the leaked version, probably some are, I don't know, some they might be from the beginning. Maybe they haven't updated the subscription plans. So half a million, it's like a wild guess. But okay. Yeah, that could be an option. We haven't done it yet, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>